Sweet perfume market. Hello and benvidos. Welcome everyone. My name is Ana Maria Faria and I am the president of the Federation of Portuguese Canadian Business and Professionals. I am delighted that you are able to join us this evening for our second speaker series. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which most of us are participating from is the traditional territory of the Wandat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and that of our moderator in Victoria, British Columbia, to be the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Recognizing where we stand is one of the many intentional acts to acknowledge injustice and to commit ourselves individually and collectively as a community to the path of truth and reconciliation. I want to welcome you all who are joining us from all across Canada tonight. We are pleased to present our second speaker series webinar, Thriving in an Imbalanced World. Today, you will hear from two Luso Canadian Canadians, Erica Pimentel and Umberto Purolo. They will each share how they are managing their work-life balance, two different perspectives, two different realities, and two wonderful stories of Portuguese Canadians living in non-traditional lifestyles. We are excited to share this time with you, and I hope that you will enjoy the panel discussion. And now a little bit about the Federation. For those of you who are not familiar with the FPCBP, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. The Federation of Portuguese Canadian Business and Professionals is a not-for-profit organization comprised of a volunteer board of directors. Our mission is to promote business activity, foster professionalism, and develop networking opportunities. We encourage academic excellence, and as a representative voice, we advocate for the prominence of our members within and outside the Portuguese Canadian business and professional community. As we celebrate our 40th milestone amidst a global pandemic, we continue forging ahead with plans to host a number of hybrid events and activities that foster business and professional development and networking opportunities for our members. Events like our International Women's Day, which will once again be hosted online on Tuesday, March the 8th at 6.30 p.m. I encourage you to visit our website at fpcbp.com to learn more about our guest speaker and to purchase your tickets. All proceeds from the ticket sales will go to fund a scholarship award for a female Luso Canadian student and also support the Federation networking activities such as these webinars. Our scholarship program is the oldest and the largest scholarship program of its kind in our community. And our Excellence Awards is an opportunity for us to celebrate and recognize notable Luso Canadians in five categories. As in the past, we will be celebrating both the scholarship and the Excellence Award winners at our annual gala, which this year will be held on Saturday, May the 28th. I hope that you will join us in this in person for a wonderful celebration. The Federation hosts various form, forums and on topical and current affairs, such as tonight's event. True to our mission, we are all about connecting people to people, people to experiences, and people to information and opportunities. At this time, I want to also thank our corporate sponsors for their unwavering support and their continued commitment. Our platinum sponsor, Carpenters Allied Workers Local 27, and our silver sponsors, Cardinal Funeral Homes, Faria Kerr Family, IC Savings, Leuna OPD Council, Leuna Local 183, the Regional Insurance Services, MDC Group, Scotia Bank, Vieira and Associates Insurance. And also tonight, I would like to express our sincere gratitude 
to Ryerson University and the Diversity Institute for hosting this webinar and providing technical support. And now it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce to you Jason Aruda, our moderator for tonight's panel discussion. Jason Aruda is currently a policy advisor and a stakeholder manager. He earned a master's in public administration and a bachelor of arts from the University of Victoria. As a Portuguese Canadian, Jason is passionate about promoting Portuguese culture and history. Serving as the director on the board, he is also the chair of the 2022 Speakers Series. Please join me in welcoming Jason Aruda, who is also joining us virtually from Victoria, British Columbia. Muito obrigada a todos. Jason, over to you. Thank you very much, Ana Maria. And on behalf of my fellow board members, I want to wish you all a good evening and thank you for joining us uh, on this webinar. As Anna Maria noted, I'm pleased to be coming to you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, where I have the pleasure and honor of, of working, living, and playing. Tonight, we have two special panelists to discuss their experiences in finding their way through work life balance in a troubling and sometimes trying state of the world and in meeting the demands that we encounter every day, despite what's going on uh, outside. Whether it is about expectations at home, with our families and friends, or how we lead others and manage our careers in our workplaces, I believe their stories of finding balance will intrigue those who are looking for their own recipe in finding their balance. Building on February with both Family Day and Valentine's Day, our aim is to leave you with ideas and inspiration in finding your balance as you navigate work relationships and your ambitions for both. Let me introduce you to our panelists this evening. First, Dr. Erica Pimentel, who's an assistant professor with the Smith School of Business at the Queen's University. Erica's work explores how technological disruption impacts how professionals engage with their work, particularly around the ethical and professional challenges accountants face in response to new technologies like blockchain and remote work. Before entering academia, Erica worked as a CPA in public accounting. Good evening, Erica. Do you wanna give us a little bit more about your background? I think you did a great job. Uh, I also a frequent contributor to the media, Wall Street Journal, National Post, and things like that. And I'm just trying to balance it all while being a mom and a wife and trying to make it work. So I'm really excited to hear about uh, Umberto's ideas about how he's making it work too. Thanks, Jason. Great. Uh, also joining us this evening is uh, Umberto Corolo. violence prevention specialist with 20 years experience in the not-for-profit uh, not sector. His extensive CV includes considerable international experience, expertise in gender equality, human rights, LGD, LGBTQ2 plus advocacy, and he has delivered several uh, workplace harassment trainings to major organizations. Humberto, can you tell us a little bit more about your story? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jason. It's a real pleasure to, to join you and, uh, and Eric in this conversation. I, um, um, yeah, my, my area of, of interest is, is human rights and gender equality and uh, ending gender-based violence and, and discrimination. And there's certainly a great deal of connection between uh, work-life imbalances and uh, those um, uh, topics in in uh, in life. So I look forward to this conversation, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. Perfect. I apologize for stumbling over your introduction. Uh, I got a message that said my internet connection wasn't working, but it seems to be false. So we're okay. Everything's fine. <laughs> the wonders of technology, of course. Uh, as you can see, we are blessed with some pretty uh, special panelists this evening, and I think both of you, having had conversations with you this week and last. Uh, have a really interesting mix about the traditional approaches to work and family with facing the modern challenges and some of our new interpretations. So I want to start with an interesting question for both of you, and I'll start with Erica. How has your heritage shaped you? You know, when I thought about what does being a Portuguese Canadian mean to me, there's really two things that stand out, and it's, it's family and it's just work ethic. And I think those two things come together and have shaped my career. I mean, I'm a mom, I have a five-year-old son, I'm married to someone that we've been together since we were 18 years old so I won't tell you how old I am but a long time and 
I got a job opportunity that would take me out of province. So um, I live in Montreal. I work in Kingston, Ontario. I don't go to Kingston every day, but I work in a different province than I live. And when I had this really great opportunity, I had to say, how am I going to make this work? And I thought back about my grandfather. So when my grandfather came to Canada, but before my grandmother and my father and my aunts came, he didn't speak English. He didn't have any resources here. And he said, I got to go. Failure is not an option for me. And he worked. He worked on putting, laying track, worked in a grocery store, picking mushrooms, whatever he could to give a life for his family. And so when the opportunity came for me, I said, I'm going to go where the opportunities are because my family needs me to excel. And so that work ethic, that committed to commitment to following your dreams, not for yourself, but for the people that you're responsible for, has been is, is so fundamental to the way I live my life and to my work-life balance equation, really. Excellent. Uh, Umberto, how about uh, for you? How's your heritage shaped the, the person you are at work and at home today? Yeah, so for, for me, it's a combination of heritage and, 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 and immigration experience. So um, I came to Canada as, as a young man. I was 15 years old, and, and I was so grateful for uh, the, the opportunity to, to come to a new country and to um, build you know, a, a life uh, that was perhaps different than, than the one that I had back in Portugal. I saw it as an opportunity to, um, uh, to advance my, my interest, to get into post-secondary education, uh, and to work hard. And, and I certainly learned that from, from my own family members who, who were here already, who instilled in me that, uh, that strong work ethic. Um, but I also learned a lot out of, out of that as well, uh, you know, through both my uh, interests in, in, in being part of all this new Canadian culture and learning the language and, and, and really integrating, but also maintaining my roots and finding my, uh, you know, my connections back to the Portuguese community. And at times feeling like I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't belong in, in this new culture. I didn't belong in the Portuguese community. So that really influenced a lot of my trajectory and a lot of the way that I experienced uh, work and life and, uh, and the lessons that I took and learned from, from that, those early experiences. And then it definitely informed the kinds of uh, views and, and approaches that I have today to work-life balance. Very interesting. So what I gather from both of your uh, answers um, is another question that I would like to pose to both of you. Do you feel a sense of obligation based on our shared history as Portuguese Canadians, the the work ethic, the, this, the ideals that come with being a Portuguese Canadian, do you feel a certain sense of obligation in your day-to-day -day life, how you approach work and life from that, or does it maybe come from somewhere else? And I'll go with Erica first. Sure. For me, it's, it's the work ethic component because people came before me and made tremendous sacrifices. Like I'm the first person in my family with a PhD and it's only possible because other people took a step back to give me a chance to take a step forward. And so anyone you talk to who's worked with me professionals say, Erica does not tire, just doesn't, you know? And I don't know if I, in a work-life balance conversation, I should be so proud to wear the badge, but, you know, I just feel so lucky that I think for me, I feel like failure is not an option because I owe it to those people. And, uh, and I think that gives me a really different perspective than folks who may come from a lineage of other people who are, have had the chance to pursue post-secondary education and it may be they have the chance to, the choice to opt out, but that, I never felt like that was a choice for me. Umberto, how about you? Yeah, and in my case, I would agree. It's, uh, it's a work ethic and uh, the pressure to, to really um, work hard and to succeed and to be a good example and to provide, you know, I definitely experience and, and continue to experience, experience those kinds of pressures for sure. But um, also, you know, uh, many times I've taken step backs and steps back and, and have wondered, you know, how good is, is that if we truly live it like that? You know, what impact is that pressure to, uh, to be successful, to work hard, to work as many hours as possible, to make a lot of money? Uh, what does that do to our own life? 
to our well-being, to our relationship with others. And, uh, and so it, it, it caused me to question a lot along the way and, and make adjustments both to myself and, and my family and also in terms of how I lead in the workplace. I'm uh, an executive director of, of an organization. I am a people manager and I have the opportunity to set that, uh, that workplace culture. And so I, it's something that I take really seriously and I, um, you know, I try to, to bring that balance into the workplace as well. If I can just bounce off something that, that Umberto just said there, you know, you're talking about accepting your culture, but then at one point saying, at some point I have to re rebel. I don't know if that's the right word, but like when I decided to go to Kingston and to, so in the fall semester, I teach in the fall, in the winter I research. So I only go actually to Kingston not, uh, three months of the year and two days of the week. So it's a really sweet gig, don't get me wrong. But when I thought about taking that job, I'm still a wife and a mother and my grandmother and my mother would have said, who's gonna make your husband suffer? Who's gonna make sure your son gets to bed on time? Who's gonna do the laundry? Like the traditional wife and mother role. And I had to challenge that in myself and say, which, which me am I prioritizing right now? And my husband is super cool. Like he, you know, he and my son think it's guys night out when I'm not around, but I really had to challenge that narrative of it's really important to have these traditional values, but not when they constrain the opportunities. And I think it's, I'm showing my son that, I, that you can make deliberate choices to live your life a little bit differently than the folks before you did. Absolutely. Yeah, and if, if I could just continue along those lines, I think for, for uh, many men, there is that pressure to be a breadwinner, to be the provider, to be the primary income earner, to make you know, lots of money is, uh, is also very impactful in, again, in how we interact with our families, with how we see ourselves and even treat ourselves and look after our own needs and how we um, uh, develop uh, relationships and bonds with our, our children and our partners. And, uh, and I think that's, that's something that we all have to work really hard on to, um, uh, you know, to, to leave behind those traditional expectations because they haven't uh, always been good for us, right? You're thinking about men or fathers, you know, and, and the expectation that they work uh, hard and long hours and, and often with more than one job, right? And, and uh, it's important to think about the, the kind of impact that that has on our own kids and our ability to form healthy and strong bonds with our children right from the get-go, our ability to contribute equally to family life and to uh, share in the household responsibilities and also to do our part in caregiving as well. We've always seen women take on that role and it's expected of them. And uh, while men tend to be the disciplinarians, the, uh, um, you know, we take a more, a more step back, but we, we have to deconstruct that kind of norm and that kind of identity and, 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 uh, and participate more equally and uh, get in touch with our emotional side, um, you know, to, to care for our kids, to join, to, to make uh, dinner together and join in those uh, family responsibilities because it's good for us too and uh, and we've been been missing out for it for too long and I know that in our community just in, in many of, of uh, immigrant communities there is those traditional expectations that um, you know that follow those gender lines and we, we need to think you know rethink those yeah so if I can build on the discussion a little bit can I ask then in what ways do you harness the traditional norms and use them in your daily life and accept them and, and find joy in them? And then in which ways do you not? And how do you, how do you take an untraditional approach to things or a non-traditional approach to things and, and manage your day-to-day -day lives? Um, Erica, if you wanted to start, because sure. you alluded to it in your, in your previous answer, I think it'd be nice to expand on it. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the most traditional part of my life is my home life. You know, I live a I have a husband and a son and we have very traditional gender roles inside the home. And so this job cho choice that I made really shook that up. But it gives me tremendous joy to be in that role, to be a loving wife and mother and to nurture my family. I really feel good 
and I feel like they're, that they're giving me something really nurturing back when I'm in that role. But that's not all that I am. And I think work-life balance is about finding moments where you can be your different self and giving time and space to each of those different things. And the balance comes from being present in the moment when you're in those different roles. And so I have very deliberate boundaries like around my, my time. For me, time is the number one resource. So people know, don't schedule a meeting with Erica outside nine and four, Monday to Friday, because that's when I'm a mom. Don't, don't even bother me. And, and so that allows me when I'm with my family, I'm completely tuned into them. But I kind of push back on that when I'm Dr. Erica Pimentel, the professor, and I'm a working woman and I am very different from the women that came before me. You know, there was women before me that were entrepreneurs, but women before me that were educated in the academic realm, they just didn't have the chance. It's not that they couldn't, they just did not have the opportunity. And so I draw strength from saying, I am sure there are women back in my father's town who could have been just like me. They could have been professors like me, but they didn't even have the chance to finish grade school. And so I owe it to them to say, I'm gonna maximize myself in, the, in this role. And so I think it's important to just embrace whatever parts of your culture sustain you and say, no, I'm gonna push back a little bit of those elements that, that, that don't, but I draw tremendous value in my life. Like passing on cultural things to my son, take, showing him like a church, this is how it works. You can burn candles. And like, that's really, really important to me but I'm a completely different person at work. You, would, you wouldn't even rec recognize me maybe. And that's how the, I, that's by having those really firm boundaries, that's how I enable balance. I'm not sure if it's the same for you, Humberto. Yeah, it, it, uh, a little bit. I mean, I think for me, I've, I've had to redefine what tradition means, right? Um, so I'm traditional in some senses and I'm a, a rebel in others, right? So starting with tradition and the things that I remember and I love most about my childhood were those moments about getting the family together, you know, our large family coming together, sitting around a, a table full of food and having great times and, and conversations and spending time together. I love that. And, and what that did for me was, um, you know, create this, this, this tradition at, in our house where, we're committed, we're always committed to having dinner together. We always sit down at the dinner table together. And, and regard, no matter what, you know, work doesn't take precedence over that. And create those moments, those times, those opportunities to celebrate milestones and achievements, to be there for our kids, to cheer them on. Like, that's so important. Um, and it's so important that, that, uh, parents, in particular dads, who are often missing from those, from celebrating those kinds of milestones, or are uh, often missing from, uh, you know, being at the dinner table or or being part of those celebrations. It's really important that we do. And then I'm a rebel in other ways. I mean, I don't have a traditional family. I am in a same-sex relationship. We adopted three kids. So there's nothing traditional about us. So we've had in our family, we've had to create new traditions and mm -hmm. celebrate our, um, our heritage, our culture, and, and create new, um, new ceremonies, new celebrations, and find new ways of, um, of doing things that totally turn those gender uh, stereotypes and norms and expectations upside down. So... Um, there is no, you know, gender assigned roles in our home. We have three sons and we have raised them and continue to raise them uh, to, to be equitable and to contribute equally in family life. And, and have they, they have great role models in their aunts and, and cousins and, and uncles. Um, but we also want them to understand that as, as young men, that, um, you know, they, they, we want them to, to look up to us and to see that as, as men, we can be caring, we can be loving, we can be vulnerable and express our emotions and deal with our mental health needs in healthy ways rather than, than resorting to violent or stressful kinds of ways. And uh, yeah, so that, you know, we're breaking the norm there, but I love tradition as well. That's this, uh, you know, where, where do I really belong? You know, how do I really do this? But I think 
I think we've, um, I think I've, I've found my, my way along the way. Interesting. I think in both of your answers, it sounds a little bit like traditional norms and those expectations are both uh, almost a point of privilege that they, they help us define our, our lives and push us on, but they can become entities of their own that hinder us. And I think a lot of our uh, guests this evening and other people that will be listening to this conversation will likely have the same similar kind of experience. How do you advise them or what tips would you give them about managing those expectations so that the hindrance that sometimes they can be would be less impactful and more positive? I think it's about choosing who do you wanna be when you grow up and staying true to that. I mean, for me, I know who I want to be. And sometimes people have not agreed with me. You know, I was a CPA for seven years before I went back into academia. I was on the partner track and I decided, no, like I'm working long hours. I'm traveling all around. And this, this is not going to let me have the kind of life as a parent that I want to have. And I gave that all up. And a lot of people told me I was insane. I mean, Eric, you're going to be a partner. You're going to make so much money. What are you doing to go back to school? You're 30 years old. You're about to have, when I started my PhD, my son was seven months old. He was sick. It was a terrible time in my life to be embarking on this academic journey. And I was like, no, like this is what I need to do. And I did it. And so I think if you say, this is the kind of person I want to be and, th and that's it. And so, and I would also say, surround yourself with people who support you in your mission. I'm very lucky. I have my mom and dad live 800 meters away. So that's two minutes drive. Yeah. And they have been my champions always. You know, for me, my work-life balance works a lot because they're always ready to step in to be, and also off, to offer like other role models for my son. So I've been deliberate in who I want to be. I've charted my own course and I've supported myself with champions and I just block out the haters because I know where I want to go and I'm going to stay razor focused on that. And if you don't agree with me, you know, I'll see you at the end and I'll wave at you from the finish line. So, I'm not sure about you, Berto. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I, accept, I I support that. You know, follow your heart, follow your dreams, and 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 sometimes doing that means questioning the things that you've learned, you've been taught, that you've um, were raised with, that the pressures that you put on yourself, that you feel from others around you, whether it's family members or or a community members, and and look at you know examples and 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 models of of uh, folks that you that you look up to and, and that you think you, you can, you know, do something similar and put your heart to it and, and put all of those expectations behind you and, and create new traditions um, and define new roles for yourself and for your family. Don't be afraid of stepping outside the box. And ultimately it's about, you know, respecting yourself about, uh, you know, meeting your needs. It's about, making changes in your life that lead to healthier, happier outcomes, you know, bring joy into your life, uh, strengthen your relationships with your, with your spouse, with your, um, with your partner, with your kids in particular, in particular, I, I think that as, again, as men, you know, for so long, we've, we've been taught that in order to be a man, you have to be a strong provider, you have to work hard, um, you have to keep going at all costs, you got to put away, put aside all of your mental well being, your mental uh, health needs, you're, you're taught that, you know, feeling um, emotional and, and vulnerable is a sign of weakness, like you, we, we have to shed all of those things and learn new ways. Of, of being ourselves and, and, and being in touch with our feelings and uh, learning about emotional literacy and, and role modeling that for ourselves, for our kids, for our peers, our family members is, is really important in all of this process and role model it at work as well. Again, if you have an opportunity to be an agent of change and to um, you know, set culture and expectations, do that openly. You know, talk about these issues openly in the workplace with your colleagues and, and encourage them to, to do the same. Break through those barriers. Uh, set examples, um, you know, as, as the executive director of, of my organization, I, I try to not communicate with staff after hours. I, try not to work on the weekends. And I speak openly about self-care, about uh, 
the importance of prioritizing uh, mental well-being and and family and work-life balance and, and all that. So these are all things we can we can do, and and it means it means stepping outside of the box, really, all all the boxes that were you know that we've kind of grown up in. I love what you're saying, Roberto, about being super intentional. You just have to be intentional about how you want to live your life and not let life just carry you along like you're yeah. just going down the river on a boat. Like you, you are the captain of your ship and you're going to decide where you're going to go. And you're going to get people that want to row with you. And if you don't want to row with me, get swim. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Eric, I like, I like the part about the, um, you know, who did you want to be when you wanted to grow up? Although for me, I wanted to play for Benfica, but I also really like cards. So I've had to redefine that. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is it, it lends itself to the conversation we had in our previous webinar last month, where every day you choose the person who you want to be and you vote in favor of that person. Before I move on to the next question, I just want to invite all our panel, our participants, excuse me, to uh, ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen, because we'll be moving to uh, questions from the floor if any uh, arrive um, shortly. Uh, so again, really interesting in those questions and the answers that I think that, you know, it really sounds like you have a strong why defined in your lives. And, you know, Simon Sinek wrote about the importance of why you start with why in your organizations, people don't buy the things you sell, they buy the, the reason you sell them. Right? And I think that's the same thing for us as managers, leaders, uh, family members is, you know, people want to know why you do what you do. Is that something you keep in mind as well when you're when you're choosing to be that person you wanted to be when you grow up? For me, it's it's a lot more about the people that I care about. I'm a bit tribal in that way, and so how can I maximize the well being of my of my family? And I think these are the people I'm responsible for. And I think sometimes when I've lost work life balance, it's because I was too caught up in the process of trying to be of trying to succeed and not having good vision for what does that success look like. Like when I was really on the partner track, that's all I saw. And I lost sight of so much else. And when I realized that there was too much compromising me and there was little, very little left of the person I am inside, I said, this isn't working for me anymore. You know, traveling all around, being, being successful, being recognized, it's nice. But if I don't recognize the person I see in the mirror anymore, this equation doesn't work for me. And so I feel that in my current role, I've been able to as I've embarked on this academic journey to say, where do I want to go? Yeah, I have some really defined professional goals, but how are they helping me support and feel enriched through the relationships that are the most, allowing me to sustain those relationships with my husband, with my son, with my parents, with my extended network. And as long as that equation still works, this is good for me. But I think sometimes when people, when you talk about putting yourself first in a workplace, people think, like, that's very selfish. That's very egotistical. And you say, well, wait a second. You know, I recognize that I am like a little self-entrepreneur, like a little entrepreneur of my business, my brand, Erica Pimentel. And as long as it works for me, great. Because you know what? Your employer might tell you tomorrow, sorry, it's not working anymore. We found we're going a different direction. And you may not have a job anymore. But if you've put all of yourself, unless you're the boss, unless it's your company, and you've given every last drop and sacrifice, every personal relationship, and you lose your job tomorrow, what's left? And I think when we, sometimes we lose sight of that, right? It's because we just get caught up in the game at work. And so in the moments where I've been able to sort of take my power back and reestablish what matters to me, those relationships and those people I care about, that's when I've been able to find work-life balance. Umberto? Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's there's that quote, and I'm paraphrasing. You know, if if you love what you do, you never have to work a day in your life, right? And and that certainly is true for, in my case. I mean, I'm working in a field of work that I've always dreamed about uh, working in, uh, because of my personal experiences of migrating, my own experiences with discrimination when I came out, my own experiences with with violence um, that. You know, I'm doing the work that I grew up wanting to do uh, and and driving the kind of change that I think is needed um, and uh, and and being passionate about it. I, I'm very passionate about this work. but but, you know, we got to practice what we promote, right? And uh, in order for there to be 
healthy families and healthy well-being and uh, for there to be peaceful relationships and uh, equal relationships and equitable relationships, we have to bring that balance into our lives. So, uh, and into our workplaces and into our communities as well, and making sure that we are taking on that work ourselves personally, uh, that we're role modeling for it, but we're also contributing to, to change in our own organizations and in our own communities. So that is a, that is a big driver for me. But even in my line of work, you know, I could work 24-7 and it, the problems would still not go away, right? So it's about realizing that there's only so much that we can do even when we're so passionate. And even then we have to put in place boundaries and limits and, and we have to be really careful about it because if we're, if we're not careful, then we can easily burn out. And I see a lot of people doing that in all lines of work right? Because th that pressure is so there, it's so real. Um, and our passions are, are so strong that sometimes we, um, we take on too much at, at great cost. And I see that in a lot of, um, again, immigrant communities where there is that pressure to, to succeed, to integrate, to learn new, new language, to find a good job, to buy a home. I mean, I, I went to school with so many uh, kids, uh, many Portuguese Canadian kids who left school early because they had to join their families uh, in, in working so they could pay off their mortgages because, you know, carrying debt is a source of shame and guilt for so many of us uh, immigrants and that, you know, having a house paid and being successful and having a car is, is, uh, uh, so much part of that identity, so much so that, um, you know, in the past, and this is probably still true to some degrees, that, you know, everybody had to help out, everybody had to step up and, and go to work and, and contribute to, to that income so we could quickly pay off our, our, our homes and our debts. And uh, uh, thankfully, that, that, that pressure was not in, never imposed on me. Although I did grow up with that strong ethic and I did, you know, in the end, finish uh, post-secondary uh, studies. I was the first one in my family to, to do so. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that I, I supported the younger generation in my family to do the same. And, and uh, I've talked about how important it is. And I know in our community, the Portuguese community, we need to continue encouraging our youth to do that. And I think Part of it is to talk about work-life balance and to not uh, just prioritize work and earning and, and, and making money and, and especially for young people uh, is to, to really promote the value of education. And this is something that the Federation does really well, by the way, and I hope that, uh, that we continue to promote those values. Excellent. So it sounds like the sum total of our conversation so far is really about intentionality and being very intentional about your time, your boundaries, your expected outcomes for yourselves. The one stumbling block that strikes me, and I find this in my own life and in conversations with my fellow board members, is communicating that intentionality and those boundaries uh, to friends, to family, to coworkers who may not understand what the balances are, may have a completely different view of um, what work-life balance should look like. How do you navigate those? Sometimes I have to, I'm working on this, but sometimes I come across a bit rude when I'm seeing <laughs> my boundaries. Okay. Like I'll tell, I, this is just like my productivity tip. There are different times of the day that you are differently productive. So you have your, my, for me, the morning, like nine to 12, my most productive time, that's my A quality. That's when I do my best work. So I don't, I try not to schedule meetings during that time. And then in the afternoon, it's like degrading. So if you talk to me between three and four, those are my, like, I'm really communicative, but I don't do really deep work. So I'm very specific about when I am willing to make, take meetings or when I'm willing to see people. And sometimes it's a little bit off-putting, but you know what? I make sure that when people meet with me, I'm prepared. I deliver value. I collaborate well. I'm willing to help people. And so I make sure that, you know, okay, maybe it's not always, you can't get a meeting with me tomorrow. Maybe you might get a meeting with me the day after, but I'll be ultra prepared for that meeting. And we will come out one meeting, all the agenda items done. So I'm really intentional about how I do use my time um, at work. So, and I, I, people know, don't book a meeting with me outside nine to four, Monday to Friday. 
I'm just very, very firm with that. Um, what with family, you see, it's a bit of a slippery slope because I will let my family time, like if my son has a doctor's appointment, that can happen in the week because he's priority number one. So I try to be very, oh, tell people up front, this is how I like to work and I'm consistent. And it's not, and I understand that sometimes there's emergencies and some things, things have to be prioritized, but I'm very, very intentional in communicating with people about how I like to structure my time. And I just tell people, listen, there's a, there's a cost benefit here. I'm a little difficult to get in touch of sometimes, but I promise you that when we get that hour together, it's going to be worth your while. I'm not sure, Umberto, if that makes sense to you at all. Yeah, it totally, it totally does. I, I think, again, it has to be intentional. I think we have to, to have these conversations in, in open and transparent ways. And I think we have to, to look at boundaries as, as healthy. It's, it's a requirement. It's, it's, you know, when we put in place those limits and those boundaries, we're more likely to be productive. You know, we're more likely to work better as a team. Um, you know, we are less likely to get sick or to burn out and therefore have to take time away. It's, it's about turning, turning that on its, on its head and, and looking at it from a, a benefits uh, or do almost like do a cost benefits analysis. You know, what does it mean if we don't establish priorities versus if we do? And I think, again, for leaders, and even we can do this at the personal level too, you know, yes, we can work hard and make lots of money and be really successful, but at what cost? At what cost? What's missing as a result of us doing that? And, and how, you know, what, what are the pros and cons of putting in place those boundaries? And, and if we do that kind of analysis, we find that, that actually we have a lot more to gain in our personal professional lives if, if, those, um, if we become really good at setting those limits. You know what, Umberto, you were saying something a little bit earlier and just kind of stuck with me. You were talking about joy. And I was thinking about how do we inject joy into our life? And some of that is by being flexible with the boundaries. Let me be honest. I'm not going to get more joy from an extra Zoom meeting at 4.30 in the afternoon. So that's not where I want to be flexible. But like this afternoon, real true story, no lie. My husband had the afternoon off. We went to see Spider-Man, okay? And that was super fun. Just to do something spontaneous with my spouse. It was great. It was wonderful. And so sometimes we have to play with the boundaries just to make because there is joy in spontaneity. And God, if the pandemic has taken one thing away from us, it's spontaneity. And so if we make time for the people we love, that for me is worth breaking all the rules. Yeah, and you know, as, as uh, like, if, if you were you know, my colleague and I, I would, as a leader, I would say, right on Erica, what a great example, do more of that. You know, I like that, I like, I like that you're setting those kinds of boundaries in place and that you don't see uh, your life just being overcome with work. And because I know that will lead to that joy, to that happiness, to that, you know, you're going to feel support from, from me as your colleague. Uh, are you going to sense that that is part of the culture that we have in the organization? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be so much happier, so much more content and, and willing to come to work and, and with your full self. And you know what, you know, those hours that you put in, I bet you they're going to be the most productive hours ever. And there's never going to be a question about your commitment, your contribution, the value of you as an employee. So we got we to gotta look at it from, from that perspective. I think that's often missing from, again, that cost benefit analysis, both in the workplace and in our personal lives. Yeah. Great. I could ask questions all night. It's been a fascinating conversation, but we have some excellent uh, questions from our participants and uh, Ana Maria is back to help us get through those. Hello. Yes, we do. We have a lot of questions here for, for our panelists um, and just a lot of great comments as well. You guys are doing a fabulous job. Um, the first question that I'd like to, uh, to share with you is uh, comes from one of our viewers and she asks, um, Jay Shetty, who wrote the Think Like a Monk, um, has a podcast. 
And one of the talks is about eight types of people that you need in your life. Um, amongst the people, he says, that you should have are cheerleaders. Um, those are the ones that keep you on track and um, you know keep you in check. So who are your cheerleaders and who keeps you on check? And that could be for Erica or Umberto. Yeah, either one. I guess I'll start. So um, my parents are, they have been my champions ever since I was little, but as I get older, I start to realize like they're too much in my corner, you know? And so I need to also go outside and find people who are going to tell me, Erica, like, this is not the greatest idea. I'm an only, I should also admit, I'm an only child. So I have my parents, I'm, I'm, my parents are my champion. They're always in my corner. So my husband is really good at just being like, just like seeing right through it, you know? And I think you have also, you need like a council of people in your life, in your professional life and in your personal life, because sometimes the people in your personal life, they don't have like the whole story about, oh, Susie and Jim, they don't talk to each other and you can't, you know, the whole workplace drama, they don't know the whole backstory. So you need professional mentors. I actually, I have a productivity coach that I meet with on Monday afternoons. We're a group of four women with a coach because I said, listen, if Tom Brady can have a throwing coach when he was in the, when he was in the NFL, how come I, as an academic, I need a productivity coach. And so I like to intentionally have different mentors in my life for different situations. So I absolutely agree with this, uh, with this uh, comment for sure. Yeah, I would say, you know, cheerleaders, either way, you know, that, that keep me going, that, um, um, you know, bring, bring joy to, to my life and, um, and in general, my kids, I would say, and, uh, um, but they also, you know, keep me honest and, um, you know, they, they don't, um, they're not afraid to say, you know, daddy, we're waiting for you. We're not going to start dinner until you join us at the table. And I think that's, that's so fantastic. And that is a sign of, of the fact that, you know, we set, we set the right expectations there where, when our kids can tell us, you know, you're missing, yeah. we're waiting for you, hurry. Um, and, and also, you know, their, their great interest in, in the work that I do and, and the kind of change that I'm working towards. And, and, and then my, my, my team as well, who, again, is not afraid to, to um, you know, to encourage greater boundaries and, and greater balance. And we're kind of, we're, we're there for each other, in, you know, in many instances, I remind them to, you know, practice greater self-care, to take more time to, um, to recover from, from challenges, from loss and, and grief and, 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 um, and, and illness, and then for them to turn around and tell me the same and remind me that I haven't uh, gone out for lunch yet, that I've been sitting at my desk for too long and, and that I need to take a break. I, I think... I think when we set those kinds of cultures and expectations, we do, then we're able to draw on that kind of um, support and from, from different parts of our life or personal and professional life. And that's so important. Thank you both for that. Um, on the same um, sort of thread, um, you know, our next uh, attendee uh, has asked, you know, life's not always and only good days, you know, how do you deal with those bad days? And when the motivation to succeed is just not there, like, do you ever question your dreams? Do you ever question, you know, your, your choices? And that's, yeah, yeah, sure. I absolutely, like, I, like, I, I was very telling you before, mentioning before how I had a career shift, you know, uh, during my life. And for a lot of people on outside, it looked like, wow, this girl is really going places. And inside, I was like, I was just killing my soul. And there was days, days when you don't want to get up to go to work because you're just like, I don't have, there is not another juice of energy, another drop of energy for me to sit in front of this client and give them advice and look, I don't care about your tax situation. I don't, you just want to tell this to their face. That's how disgusted at one point I was. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know what? Sometimes you just need to extract yourself from that situation and say like, if you have, everybody's gonna have a bad day once in a while. But when bad days turn into weeks, turn into months, maybe it's just a bad situation. And so constantly having, being a bit reflective in that way is very helpful. And just walk, somebody just got to walk away. Like if I'm working on a project now and I'm just hitting the wall, I'm just hitting the wall. 
I'll change tasks. I'll work on some teaching stuff or I'll just pick up my son early and take him to the park. So I think we just need to be kind with ourselves that we're not always productive. And if you're just not in the right headspace, sometimes pushing yourself against the wall is not going to get you to the goal. You need to walk away, get refreshed and come right back. Umberto? Yeah, you know, I, I would say that that is be, be kind to yourself is my mantra, right? And I do often I share that with, with my team members, with my family members as well. Be kind to yourself always. Um, but I think for so many of us that there is that pressure. And again, there's, there's a gender divide here too, right? For so many men, we're taught to keep going at all costs, right? To acknowledge that we're going through a rough time, that our mental health is not so good, that we're, you know, we, we have emotions that we're not able to freely express, that we're bottling up, that we have issues and, and, and perhaps, um, uh, you know, histories that haven't been addressed yet, but yet we, we, we're expected to keep going and, and we put that expectation on ourselves as well. Again, it's time to rethink that. It's time to um, to find, uh, you know, to take a break and to think really uh, hard about what those kinds of expectations mean to us, and and what is the alternative? You know, how can we bet, get it in touch with our feelings in healthier ways? How can we uh, talk about and express and work through those feelings without resorting to to violence or to control or to domination? Um, and how do how do how should we, you know, look for help? Sometimes help is needed. Sometimes it's it, it's it's okay to, you know, look for a counselor to go to the doctor to talk about these issues to talk to friends. You know, so many men keep these things to themselves and uh, they don't, you know, get help and and everything becomes bottled up. And we know, especially during COVID-19, right, our uh, rates of isolation, our rates of depression, that's had a significant impact on the lives of men as well, which has led to, you know, higher rates of family violence, of men using violence in their relationships. We've seen, you know, the numbers of um, calls to police lines and women and children leaving homes to go to shelters. That's increased significantly. And, and, and we need to think about the connections between that and mental health and gender stereotypes and expectations. And, and for so many men, that means we, we, we just need to think differently about our mental health and, and, and practice it in healthier ways. For sure, absolutely. We have uh, another great question. Um, earlier on, we talked about, um, or you talked about uh, traditional stereotypes. Um, and this question comes from another uh, participant who said, um, you talked about challenging the traditional stereotypes of being a mom um, and being a wife and a caregiver or a provider and a breadwinner. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced or you had to overcome by breaking these traditions? in these traditional roles? You know what? I, it wasn't anybody, it was me. Because when I told my husband, I'm taking this job in Kingston, I'm bidding on me. He's like, great. I told my parents, great, we're so proud. Mazel tov. Another Jewish too, you mazel tov. Anyway, um, and it was me. I was the one who was getting in my own way with my own expectations about, you need to be home to put the supper on at five o'clock. You need to be home to make sure the laundry's done and everybody's clothes are let out, set out in the morning. But when we give ourselves a space to experiment, it seems like everybody else is ready to move forward. And so I think that sometimes we let traditions constrain us when really, you know, do you think the people who immigrated from Portugal, Umberto included, somewhere, somewhere, he said, well, listen, we're breaking with tradition we're a completely changing continent. And these folks were ready to do it. So why are we not? Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I think we are our worst uh, barriers. Um, but you know, if we're able to overcome that, we can also become our, our greatest uh, champions as well. Um, but it takes a great deal of, of, um, of thinking and rethinking our own identity, you know, shedding some of those pressures and those learnings that 
you know, we got from a very young age, right? Uh, and leaving that stuff behind. And then again, doing that cost benefit analysis, you know, how good is it for me to keep going at all costs, to not look for help, to not talk about my emotions freely, to not, you know, build or spend more time with, 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 my, ki with my kids, right? I, th that, that has to be a part of it. I think in our culture as well, uh, guilt and shame also plays a significant role, right? The shame of appearing weak, a shame associated with not fitting that traditional mold and expectations. Uh, and in, in my case, it's certainly a great deal of what I had to go through in order to, you know, come out and, and to be comfortable with myself and, and to be, um, you know, to, to be happy with who I am and, and, and to be, you know, to, to, to adopt kids and to be open about my life. I had to overcome all of that. And I think not just because of my sexual orientation, this is not just something that, um, you know, members of the LGBTQ community have to go through. I think all of us, and I think that, that, that worry of what will others think of me, what kind of judgments will be placed on me, that kind of uh, shame, you know, what kind of, uh, how will my family be um, treated if I step outside of those expectations of those stereotypes, you know, how will my family members look at me if all of a sudden, sudden as a dad, I'm going to start, you know, taking more care of my kids, you know, and even in a heterosexual relationship that I'm going to spend more time with my kids, I'm going to cook and, and, and you know what, I'm going to take time off work to be my, with my kids, I'm going to take, you know, an extended parental leave. Um, and, and so shame and guilt plays a, 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 you know, a strong role in that as well. And we have to get rid of it. And again, we have to, to, um, to think about what we can gain from stepping outside of those traditional roles. So that, that is so true. And on that topic of traditional roles and, and the tradition and culture, um, we do have one question uh, from one of our viewers here who says, you know, he's really curious about um, what you think needs to be done in order to keep our cultural community alive, you know, um, without youth stepping up or being involved. Um, how does the community continue, our Portuguese community, continue to keep the festas alive? How do we continue to keep our language um, and, and, and all of our cultural traditions? Or, or or do you actually think that being a Luso descendant will be simply contained within our familial traditions um, and maybe less of a community presence? What are your thoughts around that? I think we have to ask ourselves what elements of that tradition are most important, right? Are the ones worth fighting for? So if it's maintaining a cultural network of folks that have a shared background, shared values, shared language, whether or not the festas are able to continue, you know, is that is that really what matters, or are we folks trying to maintain a shared heritage? And that's a different thing. And what elements of our share of our heritage are we out, are we trying to advance? Is it language? Is it history? Is it keeping ties with Portugal itself? And so, I think we have to rethink just what elements will attract and retain young people, like. The, the clubs that are that my grandmother used to go to, you know, and they would go play cards on a Tuesday afternoon, that appeals to a certain demographic. What appeals to young people? Maybe it's a set, uh, sorry, Senka says a happy hour or whatever. Having different activities that appeal to different se segments that will just keep Luso Canadians together and con convening. I think that's what matters the most. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I agree. I think it's it's creating new traditions. I'm, I'm an example. I've given some examples of that. I think that's really, really important, especially traditions that are inclusive, that are welcoming, that, uh, um, you know, look at, at uh, you know, members of the community that have been excluded uh, for various reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, there are some traditions that are not worth keeping. Uh, you know, stereotypical, exclusionary, uh, you know, discriminatory traditions. We got to do away with those and uh, we got to create new traditions for ourselves. Not every 
you know, point of culture and history, uh, uh, you know, is, is worth celebrating. There are some that need to be rethought, need to be deconstructed. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, organizations like the Federation are clubs and associations in the Portuguese community in Toronto and around the, the country really uh, need to do some, some soul searching um, I need to think about what they need to do differently in order for all of us to belong, to, to be able to engage and participate in proud ways and, uh, and so that we don't feel like we, uh, we don't belong there. And for, certainly that was the case and continues to be the case in, in, with, with me for so long uh, in that uh, I, I continue to question, you know, my, my uh, belonging in, in the Portuguese community. And uh, there are certain aspects of me that can't reconcile with those traditions, and and uh, I won't I won't be able to because it would mean um, giving up so much of what I am, and I'm not willing to do that anymore. I did that for too long, not anymore. No, indeed, indeed. Um, I, I, there are so many questions and we could go on and on and on and on. Um, and, you know, obviously our, our viewers are really interested in, in uh, tonight's panel. In fact, um, one of our viewers has uh, eloquently shared her thoughts about tonight's uh, panel discussion. And I'd rather uh, read her, her comments because I think they're so apropos to everything that we've heard. And I believe what many of us are, are feeling as well. Uh, our viewer says, it is an absolute pleasure listening to you both. I completely resonate with so much of what you are both saying and hearing what you say. Then the things that you've said in some cases really reaffirms that I am on the right path. And in other cases, reminds me that I still need some work to do myself. So I want to thank you for taking the time to join the Federation tonight and sharing your stories with all of us. I don't think I can say it any better than that. On behalf of the Federation, thank you both very much for, uh, for sharing your time with us. Um, it's been a wonderful evening. And uh, Jason, final yes, thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, we probably could have gone for another hour or two. Uh, it's um, you know, nice to hear the ties that bind us. And I think there's lots to build on as far as keeping our traditions alive. Uh, I wanna move into thanking all of you for joining us this evening. On behalf of our president, Ana Maria Feria, and my fellow board members, we're grateful that you've taken some time to uh, participate in this webinar with us. And I hope you found it as inspiring as I have. Uh, now in our 40th year, the Federation has a long standing history in promoting and championing critical discussion and advocating for the Portuguese Canadian business and professional community. We at the Federation appreciate you for joining us this evening and we encourage you to become a member. Uh, after this event, we will be sending out a survey so you can continue uh, to um, dialogue with us and we'll do our best to improve our offerings as we move forward based on that feedback that you offer us. Uh, and in addition to encouraging you to become a member, I encourage you to follow us on all our social media channels to keep up with our current events. Uh, I'd also like to thank our corporate sponsors and our members for their continuing support. And I'd like to thank our technology partner this evening, the Diversity Institute at Ryer Univ Ryerson University. Additionally, I'd also like to thank today's advertising sponsor who is up on your screen at the moment. And uh, with that, I will thank you and say good night and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you all, have a good night. <laughs>